All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonah Rothstein. I'm a Judaic Studies and International Studies major. So it's great to be presenting on topics that are near and dear to my heart. Um, this is session two of the colloquium, and we are in room C right now. The title of this session is Digging History, Farming Faith, and Finding Borders. The presenters will be Nicole Awid, who will be presenting on the Gris Griswold Point Connecticut University of Hartford project, History, Archaeology, and Geoscience. Kaylee Schraeberg will be presenting on Return to the Land, a study of Jewish farming efforts worldwide. Evan Bennett, a senior, will be presenting on Ancient and Modern Borders of the Land of Israel, Past, Present, and Future. And Daniel Fitzpatrick, also a senior, will be presenting on the Gates of Jerusalem, Then and Now. So I'd like to welcome up Nicole Allen. Okay. Okay. All right. Welcome to the Undergraduate Research Colloquium. My name is Nicole Awid. I'm a freshman here at the University of Hartford. And my project is titled Searching for Our Pre-Colonial Past and Post-Colonial History Using Archaeology, History, and Geophysics at Griswold Point in Connecticut. So the location of Griswold Point in relation to the state of Connecticut is right along the shoreline, as you can see here. And the Griswold Point site in itself is 210 acres, 17,500 square feet, and it's one of the most historic places of Connecticut and American history. I'll get into why that is in a little bit. So just a little bit of background into the Griswold family. They're one of the first families in Connecticut beginning in 1645. Matthew Griswold I received a grant of land as payment for his care and work with Lord Fenwick's wife's gravestone. Matthew I was a stone cutter, so as payment for cutting Lord Fenwick's wife's grave, he was paid the land that is now known as Griswold Point, formerly known as Black Hall. And after receiving this land, Matthew built the first house in 1645. This house is still marked by the old well that has been integrated into the main house on the property today. And on these acres were and are the homes of two governors of the state of Connecticut, Matthew Griswold and Roger Griswold. A history was written of the family in the early 20th century, and Professor Griswold of Hillier College is now at work on a new comprehensive history of the Griswold family. So today, Griswold Point is also crucial to nature conservancy in Connecticut. It's one of the most important wildlife preserves in the area. It strives to protect the piping plover and the least terns. So this study combined history, archaeology, and geophysics into one project. Um, my work essentially was to place two previous excavations, one done by Yale University in 1939 and 1940, and one done by Connecticut College in 1985 and 1986, and place them in context with a non-invasive GPR survey that Professor Freund, Professor Harry Joel from the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, and I performed on the point. So as you can see, the various stages of my research, um, from November to December, we analyzed the historical, or historical narratives of the Griswold family and kind of gained an understanding of what they thought was on their land. In December, this is when we performed our ground penetrating radar survey. In January of 2014, Professor Freund and I visited the Yale University Peabody Museum to photograph available Prowse artifacts from the 1939 excavation and consulted with the Peabody Museum director, Professor Roger Conglin. From February to March of 2014, we did more library work and consultations with Dr. Nicholas F. Bellatoni, who's a Connecticut state archeologist, and uh, Dr. Lucy Ann Lavin, who is the director of research and collections at the Institute for American Indian Studies in Washington, Connecticut. And in April, which is this month, I prepared a write-up of our work and this presentation. So what's important to understand about the history of Griswold Point is that its, its micro-history is connected with the major macro-history of Connecticut, New England, and the colonial history of the US. So essentially, this all begins with the Pequot War. Now, the Pequot War was an armed conflict between the Pequot tribe and an alliance between the Mohegan tribe, the Narragansett tribe, and the English colonists. Um, unfortunately, the Pequots lost the war, and over 700 were killed or sold into slavery, and many others dispersed throughout the US. Uh, what's important to understand about this is that the Pequot War opened the coastal settlements along Connecticut's shoreline. So this is how Lord Fenwick was able to give the land to Matthew Griswold I. So as you can see, it is all connected in a very big way. So now I'm going to speak about our project, which was the GPR survey that 
Professor Freund, Professor Harry Joel, and I performed on the point. So the orange grid here, which is 30 meters by 20 meters, is the entire site we performed our GPR scan. And the blue grid here is 10 meters by 5 meters. And for this one, I'll get into the antennas in a little bit, but we essentially used an antenna that gives us a greater resolution, <coughs> resolution so we could see, um, we could get a greater understanding of what was under the surface by getting some more detail. Now, what is GPR and how does it work? Um, GPR is an acronym for Ground Penetrating Radar. Essentially, it uses AM, FM radio waves to send a pulse into the ground. And the computer, as you can see, Professor Joel holding the computer there, uh, the computer then receives the echo back from these radio waves and from that builds an image of the soil underneath. So this is the most effective way to perform a completely non-invasive um, archaeological study of a site. Now, our GPR survey method, like I said before, we use two antennas, 225 megahertz and 450 megahertz. Now, 225 megahertz has a lower frequency um, and a greater depth of penetration, but it has a lower resolution. So this is why we used 450 megahertz for that smaller area. Now, I worked with Dr. Joel on the GPR system. He's done many studies like this all across the globe, and he brought his equipment from Wisconsin, and he taught me how to solve problems in archaeology without doing any excavating. And the goal of our project was to document and evaluate the existence of possible remains from buildings or artifacts and the land use of Griswold Point for different periods using both remote sensing and ground surveying techniques. So the location of our study was also near the location of a study that was done by Connecticut College in 1985 and 1986. The yellow line here represents where Yale University did their excavations, and the green dot represents where we performed our GPR survey and where Connecticut College performed their excavations. Now, the reconstruction of where these sites were was not an easy task. We assumed it would be easy. Um, however, it was not. It required a lot of library work. And at the end, we had to do geosyncing that was done by specialized equipment at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire to find exactly where these excavations had taken place. So some of the GPR survey results, as you can see on the top right, here's an image from line 21 of our grid. And as you can see in the blue highlighted area, there is an intense disturbance about a meter down. This may be an area where we might want to get some more information about what lies underneath the surface. So samples might be taken, or this could be cored rather than excavated. And on the bottom, we see another disturbance from line seven of our grid. And this is a less intense disturbance, and it's at a shallower depth. So this may have been where Connecticut College had excavated. So now I'm going to speak about the previous excavations at Griswold Point, first being the Yale University excavation from 1939 and 1940. There were many Native American artifacts found, uh, hundreds of arrow points, 22 knives, uh, bone awls, all from the late woodland period. There were also two burials. Um, these aren't necessarily a part of the Pequot War. They could have been from earlier settlements here. Um, the important thing to understand about this is that this site was then seen as completely Native American, and this would later influence the Connecticut College excavation some 40 years later. However, along with the Yale University excavation, there were very modern artifacts that were found along with the Native American pieces. I actually photographed these from the Yale University Peabody Museum, and as you can see, there's some nails, um, a piece of a horseshoe, there's a door hinge, and a piece of European pottery. Now I'm going to speak about the Connecticut College excavation, which took place from 1985 to 1986. Um, the, site was, the excavation was supposedly started when a U2 photograph was seen that researchers saw patterns in the grass that seemed to indicate that there was habitation. Here you can see an infrared photo of where they actually did their excavation. You can see right there, that's the site. And they use something called the post-hole archaeology field method. Essentially, this is when archaeologists bulldoze a very thin layer of the ground, and it will reveal these post holes, which were the fence posts that were put in 
Um, as you can see by this picture here, that's what they look like. And they act as a negative in the ground and it enables archaeologists to map out the shape and by that it might reveal the origin or type of structure. So their conclusion was that they did find post holes in the field of Griswold Point and some artifacts were interpreted by Professor Julie who was at the excavation as circular wigwams. So this shows where they actually mapped out the circular structure. So that was their conclusion of the study was that it was a circular wigwam, which is a Native American stockade fort. Now what exactly is a stockade fort? Um, stockade fortifications are basic forms of defense. They've been in use since ancient Rome. Um, essentially they were made out of wood and sometimes reinforced with mud or clay. And stockade culture in America began to develop among the Dutch when they first came to America. The English then followed building their stockade forts and of course the Americans, the Native Americans, built um, wigwams, which you can see an example right there. So the summary of our GPR was that the, it holds much potential for better understanding of the subsurface and past disturbances and it allows us to evaluate whether the postal archaeological theories from the Connecticut College really show what archaeologists think they showed because we can actually see below the areas they did their excavations. And GPR is just an effective method for locating and mapping possible subsurface features that archaeologists never got to or they missed other areas of interest. So GPR can help us see that. Now the archaeological conclusion of our study was that the remains are very complicated to interpret. Now the apology that was done leaves us with the idea that the structure could have been a wigwam, a Native American, presumably a Pequot settlement, or a colonial house stockade protective settlement. Settlers did build circular fences for protection to try and imitate the appearance of a Native American wigwam. So that could have also been a possibility. And without any further evidence, there's really no way to definitely say the origin of the structure is either Native American or European. Now there are many other opportunities in the future that the University of Hartford and the Griswold Point Association could work on together. The history of colonial America started here and perhaps we can inspire more students to do projects like mine. There could be state and federal research grants, weekend classes, collaborative programming with the Florence Griswold Museum and the Lyme Art League, community service projects for students, and opportunities for sabbatical getaways for faculty writing. And lastly, I just want to thank the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and the Dean of Hillier College for supporting my project and Professor Joel's visit plus the equipment shipping of his GPR unit from the University of Wisconsin and continuing to work with me. And I also want to thank the Greenberg Center and Professor Freund for giving me this wonderful opportunity to do this research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicole. I'd like to call up Jane Freiberg next to present on Return to the Land, the study of Jewish farming efforts worldwide. Uh, my name is Kaylee Schraberg. I'm a junior here at the University of Hartford and my major is criminal justice with a minor in Judaic studies. My topic which I'm going to be speaking to you about today is return to the land, Jewish farming worldwide. Um, I was able to research this topic with the help of Dr. Freund and the Greenberg Center so I'd like to thank them for their help and support. And I'd also like to mention before I get started that the Greenberg Center is mounting an exhibition on this topic 
of Jewish Farming Worldwide in the Museum of Jewish Civilization located in the library. And the exhibit's going to be opening May 1st. I'm going to be speaking on 19th and 20th century attempts in North and South America, Europe, and Israel to reestablish farming as a part of Jewish life. Biblical society was primarily an agricultural society, but during the past 1800 years, the Jews were not involved in farming efforts in the countries uh, where they lived because of legal and social issues. In the 19th century, thanks to the efforts of Jewish financiers in Europe, uh, land was purchased in Argentina, Brazil, Palestine, the US, and Canada, and immigrants were brought to work the land. These efforts were extremely successful in Latin America, but also locally here in Connecticut. And in the post-Holocaust era, displaced persons, mainly survivors of extermination camps, uh, were also taught farming in DP camps in Europe in preparation for their future immigration to the new state of Israel. So first I'll be discussing the Jewish farm mo movement in Connecticut. The Jewish Agricultural Society in New York began an effort in the 1880s to settle new immigrants, um, mostly Eastern European Jews, on farms in places like Colchester, Lebanon, and Montville, Connecticut. With its proximity to New York, Connecticut developed a substantial Jewish community, and many Jewish immigrants came to America fleeing from Europe, where they had been persecuted, prohibited from owning land, and forced to live in ghettos. The Jewish Agricultural and Industrial Aid Society's goals were to take the Jews that were living in urban areas and help them to find work on a farm. And this was because the cities that were densely packed with Jews, such as the Lower East Side of Manhattan, had uh, terrible living conditions, and they were worried that Jews might be the subject of anti-Semitism. They hadn't quite assimilated into American society with the way that they dressed or the language that they spoke. So the organization gave loans to tradesmen so that they could acquire homes in agricultural societies and get farming equipment, trucks, furniture for their homes. Uh, they granted mortgages for Jews, and the farmers were responsible for keeping the property insured, cultivating land, and paying taxes. The JAS published a magazine called The Jewish Farmer, which was written in both Yiddish and English. Uh, the magazine helped explain simple farming techniques, such as how to stack hay or plow a field, and it helped to relieve the loneliness of farm life by reporting on social events, fairs, and prize-winning crops, all in a familiar, familiar language. <clears throat> Eastern Connecticut may be the place Jewish farmers found the most success in the U.S. In 1897, about 20 Jewish families settled in the Connecticut River Valley, a model agricultural colony in the Rockville, Vernon, Ellington region of Connecticut, emerged by 1900 based on tobacco, potato, and some dairy farming. According to records from 1909, Connecticut was the largest state association in the Federation of Jewish Farmers of America. And there were six town chapters in the associ association. Uh, Ellington was 72 members, Colchester with 143 members, Chesterfield with 63, Fairfield with 58, East Lyme with 40 members, and Litchfield with 20 members. So that's 396 members of Jewish Farmers Associations in Connecticut in 1909. Um, it's safe to estimate that the 396 farmers had families averaging six people and that there were therefore around 2,376 Jews living on Connecticut farms at the turn of the last century. Many were intact Jewish communities with synagogues and even mikvahs. Uh, a good deal of these family farms went bust during the Depression years, but the ones that remained or got into farming around 1940 thrived during the Second World War with its, uh, the peak high demand for eggs and other products. At its peak right after the war, the Jewish farm population in America consisted of around 25,000 families. So as you can see, um, this picture was taken in 1940, and it's a pic picture of Abraham Lapping in the barn of his dairy and poultry farm in Colchester. Uh, now, these pictures were taken on Humpty Dumpty Farm in Chester, and on the right is Roberta, Roberta Buland as a baby, and on the left is a picture taken in 1941 of her father securing chicken crates on the back of his truck with the chicken coop in the background. Um, 
This farm was bought in the early 1930s by Roberta Bielan's grandfather, who emigrated from Poland. She says, uh, I remember my father, Joseph Freind, packing up the rear of the Chevy Coupe automobile, a two-seater, with freshly killed and dressed chickens wrapped in brown paper to deliver to his customers from Chester to Old Saybrook. Um, at the time, there was no real synagogue, but rather the Jews in Chester gathered for Jewish holidays and some Shabbats at the Chester home of the Romanovs. In 1952, several Jewish families bought a church to convert to a synagogue, and there was at least four Jewish farms within a half mile of my family's farm. Uh, on the left, you can see your father pumping the water from the well, which were common to have on farms. Uh, the barrel holds rainwater. It's also used to soak the chickens to be sure they were clean after they were uh, killed and dressed. And on the right, this is a photo of twins, uh, Sydney and Jaime Kaufman, who were cousins of Roberta's mother on their bar mitzvah day, which took place on the farm. A uh, very extended family often visited the farm, usually from New York, because they preferred celebrating life events in the country as opposed to the big city. Uh, Roberta Bielan talks about her mother being an integral part of the labor force of the farm who dressed and wrapped the chickens for sale every Thursday. So often women did work hard on the farm and were just as important in the everyday maintenance of the farm as the men. Uh, this is an interesting slide. You can compare the sort of photography of uh, both these photos. The photo on the left of a woman from Denver's farm in Colchester uh, it was obviously a, you know, a staged photo. She seems to be wearing her very best clothing, whereas the photo on the right of Sarah Rostov um, is a more accurate photo of what the women working on the farm would dress like. I cannot discuss Jewish farming without mentioning these three individuals. Uh, Baron de Rothschild of France, Baron de Hirsch of Germany, and Montefiore of England, who are all Jewish entrepreneurs. Uh, Baron de Hirsch was already mentioned because he founded the Jewish Agricultural and Industrial Aid Society in 1900, which set up land for farming here in the U.S. Um, he earned his money and became successful from the Oriental Railway. He founded the Jewish Colonization Association in 1891 with $10 million and later an additional $40 million in assets. He anticipated as many as uh, three and a half million Jews immigrating to the Pampas in Argentina. And his agents purchased vast tracts of Argentine land in the Entre Rios area of northern Argentina, provided infrastructure, tools, and personnel for that. The first few years of the agricultural experiment in Argentina were a disaster, both in the number of Jews who came and stayed and the agricultural successes. Uh, but by the first part of the 20th century, however, the ICA colonies proved to be one of the great agricultural success stories of the century and uh, increased the general immigration to Argentina as a result. So Latin America is made up of 20 countries, half a billion people live in, in Latin America, um, but there are approximately 400,000 Jews. And at its highest point in the 1960s, Latin America had about 750,000 Jews living, in, living there. Um, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Venezuela, Uruguay, and Colombia are the countries in Latin America that have the largest Jewish populations. The first Jewish community in Argentina was uh, founded by crypto Jews, also known as uh, conversos or Moranos, who fled Spain and Portugal during the Inquisition. <clears throat> many people may wonder why there are so many Jews in Argentina compared to other places in Latin America. Uh, Argentina fashioned its constitution after the US. So Argentina established religious freedom, but at the same time wanted it to be a Roman, Roman Catholic state. <clears throat> Article 25 of their constitution encouraged European immigration, especially those willing to work the land, and they offered economic enticements to do so. Um, <clears throat> also, during the 19th century, many Sephardic and Mizrahi immigrants left the Ottoman Empire and came to places like Argentina, and they spoke Ladino, which is Spanish written in Hebrew characters. <clears throat> in the 1800s, large waves of Jews came from Tsarist Russia, and the Jewish Colonization Association uh, established in coordination with the Argentine government a plan for mass, mass immigration of Eastern European Jewry. The farming collectives which were set up in Northern Argentina and which even Theodore Herzl pondered as a possible Jewish homeland in his uh, 1896 book, The Jewish State, brought over 100,000 Jews to Argentina. 
And the main reason why Herzl was able to consider Argentina was because of the efforts of Baron Hirsch. And he, similar to other Western European Jews of the period, were shocked by the situation of the Jews in Russia after the rise of Tsar Alexander III. Jewish gauchos, or in Spanish, gauchos judios, were Jewish cowboys who earned their living working the land. Uh, they were Jewish immigrants who settled in fertile regions of Argentina in agricultural colonies established by the Jewish Colonization Association. Uh, Hirsch resolved to help Russia's Jews and bought more than 198,000 acres of land in Argentina. Uh, among these colonies are Colonia Lapin and Rivera in the province of Buenos Aires and Bavio Basso in Entre Rios. In August of 1889, 824 Jewish immigrants arrived from Russia on the steamer Wesser and settled in the Moisesville colony in the province of Santa Fe. Moisesville was founded in 1889 by Jews fleeing pogroms in Russia. At its height in the 1940s, Moisesville had four synagogues for a population of 5,000, a Yiddish theater, Jewish schools, and the oldest Jewish cemetery in Argentina. Since the 1950s, hundreds of individuals from Moisesville have emigrated to Israel or larger Argentinian cities like Buenos Aires or Rosario. And the Baron de Hirsch Synagogue in the picture on the top is the only one of the four synagogues still functioning there. The immigration of Jews from Europe to now living as gauchos in the Pampas had unforeseen consequences. One was that um, these agricultural settlements were mostly made up of men. So slave traders, some of whom were Jews, exploited the situation by creating prostitution and organized slave trading. And they brought in Jewish women from shtetls in Europe to marry these Jewish men. <clears throat> and this organized crime group operated from the 1860s to 1939. And the situation was so well known that Shalom Alechem, the most popular Yiddish writer of the period, <clears throat> even published a short piece in Eastern European newspapers uh, entitled The Man from Buenos Aires, which highlighted a Jewish slave trader. <clears throat> in Argentina, the situation had long 